of you here in the space and the ones of you on Zoom all together here. Sorry, I think I bumped the microphone. And there should be a word for this. The joy and the heartbreak and the loss and all of it wrapped up together that is this moment. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Almost two years ago, we closed the church building for two weeks and that that was prudent. And then that became months and almost two years. And I had dreamed about a triumphant return, a return where all of us were packed tightly into this space, singing our hearts out, having a potluck. When we had defeated the virus. And that's not what this is. It is great. There are more of us in the building today than there have been since early March 2020. We have figured out how to Zoom so we can have dozens of people with us that way as well. That some of us will watch on YouTube even later. So there is all of this, there is joy. It is so good to be together, even in smaller numbers, even with distancing. So welcome back to those of you who are here in this space. And welcome to those of you who are here for the first time, because there are those among us who found us on Zoom. I'm so glad you found us. And welcome to everyone who is with us on Zoom, because that is the right choice. And this community can hold all of that, right? Everybody doing the thing that they need to do to keep each other safe, keep themselves safe. So however you feel today, know that there is room for that in our gathering across space. No, so come being fully ourselves, knowing we don't have to feel one way about all, any of this, that we can hold it all, that we can live in this world that is baffling and broken and beautiful all at the same time and know that that is true. So come, let us gather in all of the ways we gather now. Come, let us piece together something that is beautiful in its brokenness and beautiful for having been broken. Come, let us worship together. Gordon Bolar, a member of services committee and I'd like to welcome you all whether you're watching remotely or those who've joined us this morning in person safely within our building um, for the first time in almost two years you know I, I was uh, watching a Sunday service in last summer and I believe people were out under the tent Chris Masros was there and he said I'm just I have tears in my eyes just to be with other people and I'm feeling what what Chris was feeling then. It's just overwhelming. I also have an insight into a phrase we use a lot here, Reverend Rachel uses a lot here at People's Church, beloved community. I'm feeling that this morning too, I hope you are. People's Church is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association. It's part of a long tradition of liberal religion. And liberalism has a faith that although the path of progress is uncertain, as we've seen, in the past few years. If we work together, we can shape our church community and other broader communities toward a better future. I think we're doing that this morning with the presence of all of you. Welcome. I'm going to forget to do that. Um, so I have several announcements for us this morning. The first is, um, so people who are in person were given a piece of paper and a crayon as they walked in. I hope people at home have a piece of paper 
and something to write with. And this is in preparation for our final song today, which will be People of Hope. And the refrain has the words love, hope, and change. So I invite you in a, in a moment or during the service at some point to write the word that most speaks to you of those three, love or hope or change. And at that moment, in about an hour when Daryl leads us in song, you are invited to hold up your word when it is when it is sung as a way to engage our bodies and just see us all move and support the things that we care about. So that is one piece. Next announcement. Those of you who are here in person saw that it took a team of volunteers to get you screened and checked in. And we are looking for more people to be willing to serve in those roles on Sunday mornings. And we need to not have Reed and Chris be the only people who know how to make our Zoom multicast work. So if you are interested in serving in either of those roles, talk to me. Next, two weeks from today, we will have a congregational meeting to affirm the work of the congregational meetings that were held remotely over the past two years and to discuss new by, a new bylaws proposal. There will be an information session about that on Zoom next Sunday at 1 p.m. at the same Zoom link for our Sunday services. Uh, because of how our current bylaws are written, you need to be present in the space to vote. So if it is reasonable and safe for you to do that, I invite you to come be in person for that. We'll be live streaming on Zoom and your go to with, with more questions or show up next Sunday at one. Next, we are in the search for a new church administrator. Chris Schluter will be moving on sometime later this spring. And so if you know someone with nonprofit administration experience, especially the financial oversight piece, please send them our way, encourage them to apply. Word of mouth is what got us Savannah a couple of years ago as our music director. So I know, yes. So I know people using their networks is one of our most effective strategies for recruiting. So please think about who you know and who might be good in that role at our church. Okay. And finally, to help it feel like we're not two different congregations, we're going to take a moment and invite people to wave. So people on Zoom, if your cameras are on and if you want to turn your cameras on and give a little wave into this space, I invite you to do that right now. See, look at all of our friends. And oh, and they're all waving back. <laughs> and so we'll just let this go for a moment. Oh, it's so good to see you. And now I invite the people in the space because they couldn't actually see your waves just now. I invite you to look at the camera in the back. So turn around and read you need to make and give, give a wave. <laughs> it is good to be together. And now Savannah is going to lead us in another hymn. One of the joys of being on Zoom is you can sing as loudly as you like, as off key as you sing, and no one will ever know unless you have someone sitting right next to you. But if you are in person, I invite you to hum or sing no louder than a whisper because forcing air strongly out of our lungs is not a safe choice in this moment. So lead us in song, Savannah. Spirit, though our bodies are apart, filled with joy and touched with wonder, separate hands but mingled hearts, giving thanks and singing praises for the
share. We are gathered in commitment to a planet that is whole. Works of justice, acts of kindness, bless the As we uh, light our chalice, if you're lighting your chalice at home, we hope you will type into your chat box, a chalice is lighted in your street or neighborhood or your home where you feel comfortable. Our reading this morning for the chalice lighting is Connected Through the Web of Life by Jennifer Grayson. We light this chalice, symbol of our purpose, to bring more love and justice into the world. We light this chalice knowing our congregation as a church dispersed across communities, not bound by walls, but connected through the web of life. In addition to this chalice here this morning, chalices are lit alongside us in Portage and Texas Township in the Vine neighborhood, the Winchell neighborhood of Kalamazoo, Oshimo, Parkview Hills, Savannah, Georgia, on Grand Prairie. There are so many chalice flames being kindled this morning. What do you do when something breaks? When one of your favorite coffee mugs gets knocked onto the floor by an errant elbow, as happens to me every few months, I have to say. What do you do? You can throw it all away and get a new one. You can, if it's just a little chip or crack, maybe turn it into a pencil holder or a pot or something that doesn't need to hold quite so tightly. There are many things you can do. Reed, can you show us the first image? Here is a very broken coffee cup. It is, and this person named well, who goes by the user named Pomax on Flickr, documented this process of what he decided to do with his broken cup. You can see he has supplies, so he is not just throwing this away. It's an important cup to him. And so he started, he sent away for the kit to do a Japanese process called Kintsugi, Kintsugi which is a way of repairing and showing the cracks in the repair. Because you could just get some super glue and hold it and carry on as though nothing has happened, just knowing that it doesn't quite fit together as nicely as it did. Or you can do this. So next he took some lacquer and some resin and put it together. Time for picture number two, Reed. And you place the pieces back together with this glue and then you have to hold them there. And the rubber bands you get from the grocery store for other places, the ones that aren't actually that strong are the right tool because if you apply too much pressure at this stage, it will move everything out of joint, but you need the gentle pressure that holds things just as you have set them and doesn't let them fall. 
And so you put the lacquer in and you let it dry and then you get your sandpaper and sand it down. And then you add a next, the next layer, which is a, like a gold dust paint, more or less, that adheres just to the lacquer. Can we see the final picture? And so you have a finished product that I would believe is more beautiful than the initial product, but shows the scars and what was broken and what has now been healed. So perhaps this is a little heavy handed metaphor for this moment, but <laughs> I've been thinking about it a lot. Like there is loss and brokenness and separateness in this moment and how, and I think our task is to figure out how we move forward in a Kintsuji inspired way that shows the beauty and the scars all at the same time. That is our story for this morning. And now I invite Ann Feldmeyer forward, who is going to introduce our special offering for today. I invite you to give generously. Those of you who are in this space, uh, I invite you to use the donation boxes at the backs by every door that you could leave from towards the back. Um, and or give online and give generously that way or send checks through the mail. All of we'll accept money no matter how you want to send it pretty much. So I invite you to support the good and important work of Open Doors today. I think there's a stool here. I'm in my hotel. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry Thank about you. that. I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. No one has sight. That's right. Here I go. Now I can see you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It seems strange to be here after so long. Usually, Stephanie Hoffman, who is the executive director of Open Doors, comes to our church. I'm sure you remember her. She's a very beautiful woman and um, always comes in very high heels, which I always marvel that she can negotiate. Um, and she is not able to be with us today, but I felt very comfortable in telling you about Open Doors. And one of the reasons I feel comfortable is many of you may know that um, I'm literally leading a Afghan resettlement team that is made up of People's Church members, the um, Congregation of Moses members, and uh, Temple B'nai um, Israel members, those two are our synagogues in our community. And we, in our resettlement process, we now have six families we're helping, and maybe a seventh, a new family just moved in yesterday to the apartment building that five of our other families live in, um, is, reminds me of what Open Doors does. Open Doors helps families who are in crisis to find stability. They've been around since 1970. They first started with a women's shelter um, called Next Door and a men's shelter then followed called Open Doors. And these shelters were designed to help singles get on their feet, usually because they've had experience with addiction and um, find employment and um, really regain stability or find stability if they've never had it. And that then real, made them understand and realize that we needed in Kalamazoo uh, what they call a residential community where we help families. They help families that are in crisis to regain stability by finding housing. And how this completely dovetails to with what we're doing with our Afghan families is they come with nothing and we have to find housing. We have to find um, there. And I'm not making a plug right now, but I, I the, 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 the juxtaposition of all this 
process is so similar. And I think the thing that has made me understand what has to happen here for our folks with open doors is so daunting and why our support is so important. One of the things for you to know about open doors is that they own 22 buildings. They have 96 rental units and two shelters. So when we donate to support them, we are supporting this major enterprise. They have over 19 staff. And the key thing about this is they do not get any funding from the government. Now, most nonprofits doing this kind of work are applying for grants kind of all over the place in order to maintain the work that they do. But Open Doors made a decision some time ago not to do this because they wanted to have more freedom to do things the way they felt would make things successful. So um, their funding comes from individual donors, uh, rent. I have a... a um, 36% come from individual donors, rent from 30, rent from the residents, 35%. Foundations give 25%. That would be foundations like the Kalamazoo Foundation, the Gilmore Foundation, the Upjohn. Um, foundations, churches, and businesses, 25%. That's where we fit in as a church. United Way, 3%, and only 1% from government grants. So they really need our community support to be able to do this. And the success they have is absolutely absolutely amazing. Once you get people settled in stable housing, it's phenomenal what they're able to accomplish. They can usually find employment, especially right now. We know that finding employment is not going to be as difficult as in other times. Um, and, and they get on their feet. Sometimes they need to continue to have a lower rent. One of the big challenges, and now I'm going to go a little bit back to my experience with reselling the Afghans, is rent's high. Rent is very high, and it's very hard to find stable housing in most communities, especially in Kalamazoo. I think we have a little bit more right now because uh, for a while our students weren't back renting. They were in virtual, um, you know, the colleges, college students. But it's, it's very challenging. So having all of this available, to um, this housing available is tricky. So I ask you to support Open Doors. We've been partnering with them for over four years. I think, yeah, I think four years, four or five years. And what we give is really put to good use and helps people start their lives over again. And I'll just segue a little bit back to our Afghans. We need some... Um, we need some volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, we have over 40 people on our team. Open Doors has 19 staff. If we had if we had staff, it'd be great, but please give to Open Doors. They need us and we need them as a community. Thank you. So I wanted to share this song this morning for the offertory. I wrote it uh, back early in the pandemic, thinking that I'd be singing it for you all like in May, two years ago. Um, so anyway, here we are. Um, it's a song called Connected. And uh, it, what got me thinking about the subject was the fact that uh, having a, a global pandemic and a virus that spreads from person to person that uh, has all kinds of implications about how we interact with each other, that the virus itself became, became a symbol of how we are all connected and how what we do uh, affects other people. So that's kind of what started it all, but it's not a song about a virus, I promise. We don't need that today. Okay. It's called Connected. And I hope someday you'll be able to sing it with me. <laughs> some great call that we are connected after all the salt of the sea is in our veins the 
Just of a burning star light years away Like rivers and lakes and waterfalls Well, we are connected after all So here we are Here we'll stay Heart to heart So now let us give thanks for all that sustains us. Please join me from the countless gifts we have each been given. Gifts of life and love and sustenance. We bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. People's Church is a community that cares for one another. And one of the many ways that we offer and show that care is by taking time during our service to invite those who wish to, to share their joys, sorrows, triumphs, milestones. 
So if you have something you wish to share today, I invite you to do so. If you are on Zoom, you can type it into the chat box. If you are here in the space, you can come forward and place a stone in the water. And if you want your milestone to be read aloud for the community, uh, there's a piece of paper that you can write your words on and I will read them. And if you just want a stone placed and no words, feel free to do that or name that Zoom people. And we're gonna figure out how to make this ritual work because I don't know how it's gonna feel today. So if you have great ideas, please let me know. And I am pausing our recording. So what is shared in this space is not uploaded to YouTube later. I invite you to still your body and your mind for a moment of meditation. I invite you to find a way to make yourself 10% more comfortable in this moment. Maybe that is unclenching a jaw or rolling shoulders or stretching. If you're at home, maybe you can wrap a blanket a little tighter or sip something warm. Take a few smooth breaths and think about your connections. We are here because of those who came before. Each of us exists because generations of biological ancestors existed, survived for long enough, and found each other. Thousands upon thousands of generations before us. It could have been otherwise. We are grateful. We are here because of those who cared for and nurtured us and those who preceded us. Thousands upon thousands of generations and care whether care from biological kin or chosen family, it could have been otherwise. And we are grateful. We are gathered because of those who founded People's Church in 1855 and those who have nurtured and sustained this community for generations. It could have been otherwise, and we are grateful. We are here because of the innovators and creators and constructors who made this moment of connection possible. The inventors of the technology we rely on and those who produced it the assemblers who made phones and computers, the developers and coders who created Zoom, the people who designed and built the cars and buses and bicycles that transported us here today. It could have been otherwise. We are grateful. Take a few smooth breaths and notice all that needed to happen to make this moment possible. From the alignment of planets and stars that made life possible on this planet, to the people who harvested the food we ate for breakfast. We are connected and dependent 
in ways beyond our imagining. It could have been otherwise, and we are grateful. May we move through the world with awareness and care for all of the beings and all of the circumstances that has made it possible for us to reach this moment. May we know the truth that we are wrapped in a single garment of destiny, an interdependent web of all existence. May our actions bring more kindness, ease, and justice to this web. May it be so. May we make it so. Amen. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe Our first reading this morning is February Ground by Marge Piercy. Three feet of snow in 24 hours on top of seven inches. Not really credible here. On the fourth day, we found the car under a six foot drift and dug it out. At first, we could not open doors. The post office shut for two days. Our road had vanished into a field. We felt the sky had finally fallen and drowned us. Six weeks now, patches of ground emerge from white fortresses. How beautiful is the dirt I took for granted. Extraordinary, the wild green of grass islands. Having the world snatched from us makes us grateful, even for fence posts, for wheelbarrow rising, for the stalwart spears of daffodil uncovered. Everything revealed is magical, splendid in its ordinary shining. The sun gives birth to rose bushes, the myrtle, a snow shovel fallen, overcome on the field of battle. The next reading is, that was entitled February Ground, by the way. I should have said that first. Next reading is entitled The Unbroken by Rashina Ray. There is a brokenness out of which comes the unbroken. A shatteredness out of which blooms the unshatterable. There is a sorrow beyond all grief, which leads to joy. And a fragility out of whose depths emerges strength. There is a hollow space, too vast for words, through which we pass with each loss, out of whose darkness we are sanctified into being. There is a cry 
deeper than all sound, whose serrated edges cut the heart as we break open to the place inside which is unbreakable and whole while learning to sing. Our third reading is A Letter in Return by Lynn Unger. And how do you live and what are your fears during this crisis? What a question to surface after midnight from across the world. In your country, it is the time of day to wrestle all the existential and daily dreads, unlike, like Jacob and the vicious angel, they concede to bless us. I am afraid that people I love will die. I am afraid that my child is inheriting a world so much harsher than she deserves. I am afraid that desperate times call for desperate measures and I am not quite desperate enough. Should I go on? I am afraid that people have wandered away from the very idea of truth. I am afraid we have unlearned how to speak and how to listen. I am afraid that the fabric that holds us together is woven more loosely than I thought, and people keep slipping through. And how do you live? With grief, with fear, with laughter, with boredom, with glee, with contentment, with fury, with hope, with the firm conviction that no thing cancels any other thing out. Death does not cancel life. Grief does not cancel joy. Fear does not cancel conviction, nor any of those statements in reverse. Make your heart a bowl that is large enough to hold it all. Imagine that you are the potter. Stretch the clay. Cherish the turning wheel. Accept that the bowl is never going to be done. Start with love that is the seed. 
In the fall of 2019, People's Church started making a mosaic. This mosaic. Do you remember fall of 2019? <laughs> Before COVID-19 was this force that shaped our lives and so many of our decisions. Before we knew about the different KN95s and N95s and cloth and surgical and all this mask stuff or many of us knew about that before most of us were using zoom so regularly when we went out in the world and saw everyone's full faces and didn't feel anxious about it it feels like an entirely different time to me but back in 2019 an idea that started with the committee on ministry was refined by gay walker and me into a congregational ritual. About once a month in the service, we would glue pieces of glass into the frame to create this mosaic. And that stopped, of course, when so much of life stopped in March 2020, when the pandemic interrupted our lives and services and so much moved into other ways of being. So the piece was left unfinished and sat untouched for over a year. And we placed more pieces, the, the final pieces that could fit in that frame last fall during one of our outdoor services. It was in, we were in the Memorial Garden surrounded by the names of our beloved dead. And this week, Gay Walker, our artist, started grouting the mosaic bringing it to this stopping point. Those of you who can see it well can see that it's about one third of the way grouted. It's a little bit hard to pick up on the image on the screen, but it's beautiful. Look at this art that we created together, the colors and the shapes, the patterns that emerge out of randomness. So those of you who are here in this space, I invite you to come look at it more closely. And we're going to keep it here for several weeks. So if you're someone who feels like you can come into this space, into this space when there aren't a few, <laughs> so many people in it, pick a time on a Wednesday afternoon and, and stop by to see it. It's a really beautiful piece of work. And mosaics have been a powerful symbol for me personally for years. And one I leaned on as I came into Unitarian Universalist ministry. I believe that our faith asks us to be mosaic makers. While we are rooted or perhaps grounded by principles and our bond of union and our history, we are not handed a creed or a canon that is ours when we become Unitarian Universalists. It is the work of each individual and each congregation to find and nurture what is holy. The stories that are worth telling again and again and again. The texts or songs or pieces of art that are our collective and individual scripture. The practices, the rituals, the ways of being together that nurture and challenge us into lives of integrity. We gather up 
these disparate, beautiful things and make something new and holy and true, a mosaic. When we started making that, this mosaic that lifetime ago, I said that any ritual worth doing holds multiple meanings. So the act of creating a mosaic is taking what is broken and using it to create beauty. It is many disparate pieces fitting together into a new wholeness, the shatteredness out of which blooms the unshatterable. It is noticing all that is broken and trying in our limited way to fix it and make the scars beautiful, like the Japanese practice of kintsugi that I talked about earlier. It is creating something together that none of us could create alone. It is finding pattern and meaning in chaos. It is honoring the grout and the other force and the forces in our lives that bind us together in a single garment of destiny, an inner dependent web of all existence. So you can see that this mosaic is not fully grouted. It is incomplete, and that feels true and right for today. When Gay suggested leaving it unfinished, I knew that was right. This project isn't done. It shouldn't be done now, and maybe it won't ever be finished in the way we thought it would be finished three years ago. Unveiling something complete and resolved and done doesn't feel like what this moment requires. It's not who we are yet because so little, it feels complete or resolved or done. And while some of us are ready and willing to be in this space for worship, for Sunday service, many of us aren't. And some people's people have told me they don't think they will ever be in this space for a large gathering again. It's just not safe for them. They will be with us on Zoom for now, perhaps forever. And even for those who are here, this doesn't feel like before. There was a sign-in process and health screening and we are distant from each other. There will be no coffee when this is over and you all came anyway. <laughs> And I have no idea when we get to have a potluck again. Gay told me that while she was grouting this, a few of the glass pieces fell out, which only adds to the metaphor, right? Standing here, there is so much joy in this room and there is absence. There are people in our church community who have died since we were last together many of whom had their seat, right? So I can stand up here and know someone should have been there and there and there, and they are not, and they won't be. And other people have left in other ways, moving away or drifting away or finding a religious community that is a better fit for them. And in those gaps, there is newness and possibility. There are people here today for the first time ever and the first time in years and years. It's beginnings and endings all jumbled together in the unfinished mosaic that is People's Church at this moment. So we're not grouting it yet, and maybe we never will grout it the whole way. Maybe it'll be bit by bit. We'll see, we'll see what feels true and trust the process. There is so much today and every day, really, grief and gratitude, joy and loss. And it is our work to hold it all without expecting it to resolve immediately or maybe ever to be beautiful and broken and baffling all at the same time. As the poet reminds us, how do you live? with boredom, with glee, with contentment, with fury, with hope. 
with the firm conviction that no thing cancels any other thing out. Death does not cancel life. Grief does not cancel joy. Fear does not cancel conviction, nor any of those statements in reverse. Make your heart a bowl that is large enough to hold it all. Imagine you are the potter, stretch the clay, cherish the turning wheel, accept that the bowl is never going to be done. Our work together and alone is to be that bowl big enough to hold it all, big enough to hold each other across distance and time, disease and heartbreak, peace and hope and joy and change. <clears throat> a few months ago, a passage in a novel caught my attention and burrowed into my heart. The book was God Shot by Chelsea Beekler, and it's about a teenage girl named Lacey May who leaves a religious cult. This is a conversation she has with Daisy, an older woman who is her boss and mentor and helping her create a new life. Daisy says, whatever's happened to you can either make you beautiful or it will ruin you forever. You decide. Lacey May responds, I'm not beautiful. Daisy says, I don't mean beautiful like you're thinking. I mean deep and changed, affected wise. When you see a woman like that, you know she's beautiful because of her undoing, beautiful because she rebirthed herself from ashes. Mosaics, bowls, broken cups. This day is full of metaphors and rebirth. This is another metaphor for this moment. I don't mean being born again like some preachers would tell you to be born again, but I'm thinking about the act of giving birth and how collectively there are ways that we are doing that holy work in this season. We are birthing something new. Those of us who have given birth or been present for birth know that it is strange and unpredictable the chaos of the birth and the elation when a wanted child arrives do not cancel each other out. We know that birth is not scripted in advance. A carefully detailed birth plan can be undone in an instant as circumstances change. And many of us have also experienced moments in birthing when we are able to access a wisdom, an instinct, a knowing in our bones that tells us what to do, how to move, when to push, when to rest. And of course, every birth is different. I'm not making a metaphor that will accompany all of them, encompass all of them. But even when births are good and easy, as far as births go, which is not that easy, it is too much. It is violent when some, a new human comes into the world. There is blood and fluids and pain. The body of the parent needs to heal afterwards from incisions and tearing, from having their internal organs rearranged by the growing child. And then there's this fragile baby in the world, this vulnerable new being in need of protection and care. And this little baby, at least in my experience, feels like a stranger for the first little while. More like potential than an actual human, this tiny wailing ball of need. It helps when they smile in six weeks, and it helps when they laugh in about three months. They grow into themselves and the caregivers begin to understand them and it's not indecipherable wailing all the time. We form new connections. So in this moment, when, we, when some of us are returning, when some of us are regathering, rebirthing feels like the metaphor in addition to mosaic making for me. We are not going back because we can't. We are not the church we were two years ago. We have been undone and reformed. 
there are losses and gains and changes that are not so easy to categorize as positive or negative. All of us have been changed by the past two years. We have been challenged and stretched and hurt by the time of isolation and overwhelm, grief and hope, change and joy that we lived through, that we are continuing to live through because this is not an ending. We are scarred. We are scarred by 900,000 deaths from COVID in our country. We are scarred by the failure of collective action to keep each other safe, by how masks and vaccines have become a political symbol and not just a way, and not simply how we keep each other safe. Relationships are strained and broken. We are changed, affected, not who we were when we started making this mosaic, even if we might be sitting in the same room again. These years are with us, part of the material out of which we try to make meaning and maybe eventually wisdom. We let that be unresolved too, ungrouded, unfinished, trusting that wisdom will reveal itself in time. So we move forward, or at least in some direction, I don't know if it's forward, Gathering all that is broken and beautiful, building a new way, rebirthing. We are rebirthing a community that gathers both in person and online and will be multi-platform like this for a long time, maybe always. Where so many of what we knew practices won't be central, at least for a while like singing together or potlucks or being a cross-generational community. We are rebirthing a community that can be a larger bowl with a greater capacity to hold all of it, grief and joy, death and life, fear and faith. It is too much. And we are living in the too much. Birth is hard, exhausting, and powerful. We are creating a new thing, a new way, something fragile, full of potential, something that we can't yet understand or know or predict, but we can show up as we are able in all of the different ways we show up to each other, care as we can with as much integrity as we can hold on to and do our best and see what unfolds. I hate this uncertainty. I miss the illusions I used to live in that I could make plans and those plans would come true. So I can't tell you a lot of things, but I can tell you what I know, that this is hard, that we will keep trying new things as a church and building new ways. We will try to create a bowl big enough to hold us all. We will make mistakes, probably a lot of them. And I hope we will learn from them and at least make different mistakes. That's what I aspire to. <laughs> Just a new mistake is progress, right? So we will try. And I hope when we make these mistakes, we learn, we make new ones and we gently call ourselves back to our deepest values. Whatever it is we are birthing, we don't know yet and we don't get to know yet will be born from our collective wisdom, our creativity, and our care. So out of the fragments, may we find an unbroken wholeness. May we feel grief and gratitude, fear and faith, love and hope and change, knowing that nothing cancels out anything else, and together we can hold it all. May we find peace with all that is unresolved, and impossible to know today. And may we know that what is true, our values, our truth, and the reality that together we can do more, create more, connect more, rebirth more than we ever could alone. May it be so, may we make it so, and amen.
hard to believe in the sun in the dark of the night and it's hard to believe in the stars and the bright morning light well we all need a place we can go to learn what it just at a very strange auction. I don't know if anyone else had that feeling, but... Um. I, I, I was tempted to, to change the line to hold signs up for love, signs up for peace, and just not the same. It is good to be together in all of the ways it is possible for us to be together. And I hope today you have found some love, 
some hope to help us navigate all of the change we have to just keep living through. So go in peace, go in love. Thank you.